Hello, everyone. Uh, in this, the is it the 22nd time that we have held the Isaac Asimov panel debate, and it's it's a success every year. We get such good guests, and I just a little bit of backstory here. Um, when Isaac Asimov died, uh, we wanted to find a way to remember him at the museum. Why? Because he's a native to New York City. He's written a zillion books, we counted, and met much of the science that went into those books was researched at the library of the American Museum of Natural History. So he wasn't just a casual tourist visitor, he fully used the resources that we were able to supply. And we got together with his widow, Janet Asimov, now deceased by several years, and his daughter, Robin Asimov, and they gathered friends and created a small endowment to sustain this uh, over the years, to keep the memory of Isaac Asimov's curiosity, cosmic curiosity alive, and to uh, stimulate that kind of curiosity in others. And what better way to do that than to get a topic about which not many people agree and just kind of have it out. So no, it's not a formal debate with point counterpoint. It's a conversation that in a way you're going to eavesdrop on. All right, I have six experts uh, in the field of space pollution. And in fact, one person on the panel represents the satellite industry who then presumably doesn't think that way about this topic. We will get more into that uh, as we go deeper. Uh, this event is, um, <laughs> what we found is once we blew through the, the controversial science topics, you know, like, is there life? Where is the life? And what's it made of? And, all, and then we realized that there's so many other topics that reach, that have science-based, but reach into our culture. And so this topic is one of them because it affects uh, uh, security space, civilian space, you know, tour tourism space, uh, uh, any other business need that might be seen, plus it affects astronomers. And so I just want to lead off with a, uh, a quick panel here. You might remember a few years ago, there was a movie called Gravity, uh, starring two uh, you know, leading man, leading woman, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. The movie really should have been called Zero Gravity because almost the entire film took place in zero G. But what was significant about it is it portrayed a plausible, you know, cinematically plausible consequence of satellites being destroyed in orbit and having those fragments destroy other satellites. And I saw this when it was first released in IMAX and it was just terrifying, terrifying because every fragment that comes off of a destroyed satellite becomes a projectile putting other satellites at risk. And so there's a paper, there are many papers, but uh, one published recently that wants to think about this problem, okay? This is a, just a video from the NASA Orbital Debris Office. What you see here is, this is from a few years ago, actually. This number is probably manifold greater. But this is a tracking of debris particles in orbit around the Earth. Uh, the, the flurry close to Earth's surface, that's, that's the uh, near Earth orbit. And you come out to this ring, which is geosynchronous orbit. And we just come in and just look at this. It's like, oh my gosh. And I, I was concluding that the reason why we actually haven't been visited by aliens is so they just saw what, what a trash heap the space was around our planet, and they didn't want to get injured. So they just went on to find some other planet. But this is, these are actual particles of space debris that are tracked. And uh, in this paper here, the case for space environmentalism, this is kind of what we're going to talk about today. And we have Several people, co-authors on this paper, Meredith Rawls and uh, Maura Baja, are on this panel this evening. And what in this paper you will find this plot. And this plot, the way these plots work is, the top line, which is black, is the sum of all the lines below it. All right? And so the, 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 the blue line are active satellites, rapidly increasing just in the last couple of years. The red line are dead satellites, all right? And then the green is like leftovers, like rocket boosters and other bits and pieces that were no longer needed after the, 
after the satellite was deployed. Then you have de debris outnumbering it all in terms of number of tracked objects. You sum all of that, you have something rising through 30,000 objects in the sky. Notice the steep jump there when the Chinese did a weapons test. They, they took out one of their satellites. It greatly, they smashed one of their satellites to smithereens, greatly increased the debris. Um, and uh, there was another one, there was a collision between two satellites. There was another abrupt jump. So we're gonna talk about all of this. Oh, by the way, 60 years ago, there was like three satellites, in, or whatever the number was. Sputnik was 1957. And so to go from a few 60 years ago to tens of thousands is just scary. I mean, maybe it's great because we're, we're becoming spacefaring, but really, uh, it's kind of scary when you think about it. And so let's go straight in here. So I want to just go, um, you'll, we'll meet each panelist as I address them with various comments. So let's first go to Moriba Ja. Moriba, um, welcome to the Asimov panel. Uh, you, you are on the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin in their aerospace uh, engineering department and you have special interest in space debris and that's you know is that on your business card debris <laughs> it sounds like it actually know. is it's space garbage man that's what's on my business yeah exactly. that's what you are okay I, i'm sorry yeah that that's even less flattering okay mr garbage man um in space but you, you you have special interest in that and because of that special interest you have certain um other you wear other hats related to space security and other interesting parties. So I'm just curious, do you have just a comment to begin us with based on yeah. your background? I mean, look, we, we, we started by launching satellites in 1957 with Sputnik and we currently track 50,000 things ranging in size from the cell phone to the space station out of which only 5,000 work and everything else is garbage. So it sounds like we have a problem. Houston, we have no Earth. We have a problem. Yes. Um, so, tell, could you just start us off? Um, could you distinguish for for us uh, between low Earth orbit, middle Earth orbit, and geosynchronous orbit with Leo, Mio, and Geo? It sounds like a triplets. Um, so, uh, what? Are they, why do they matter in terms in the conversations we're having? Yeah. So, look, we don't want to just launch satellites randomly in space. We, we have specific purposes for these things. And so things in low Earth orbit, mostly things like global internet with the Starlink satellites, OneWeb, you know, that sort of stuff, and Earth observation satellites that are useful for uh, weather monitoring and climate change monitoring and these sorts of things. Mid-Earth orbit. So LEO goes all the way up to about 1,200 kilometers of altitude. Mid-Earth orbit satellite takes about 12 hours to go around once in its orbit. That's a place where we have global navigation satellite systems like global positioning system that sort of thing things that we use on our cell phone gps to, yeah gps right gps it's like, global yeah, gps exactly right you know the blue dots on the cell phone that tell us where we're located and that sort of thing and then geo these are things that take about 24 hours uh which kind of coincides with what people associate with a day um that's where we have communication satellites uh, and that's about thirty-six thousand kilometers of altitude Okay, so that's so. When we talk about debris, uh, we might have to be specific about what zone the debris resides. That's in. right, the zip code. That, yeah, that's there fair. You go. Okay, okay. Let, let me go to Connie Walker. Uh, uh, Connie, you're, you're an astronomer with the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, very well known to my entire community, and you are a key person in their research-based education, uh, the science education department, but. That's not why we have you here. We have you here because you are a, a manic activist. Can I use the word manic? Is that allowed? <laughs> manic activist with, sure. Uh, sure. I'm glad, uh, a manic activist with the International Dark Sky Association. Now I have, a, just to tell you how, how, how activists they are. When we opened the new Rose Center for Earth and Space in Manhattan in the year 2000, replacing the previous planetarium. We had these tiny little lights embedded in the sidewalk, just to give the sidewalk a little bit of vibrancy. I got a letter a week later from the head of the Dark Sky Association. Why do you have lights pointing straight up? You have to set a good example. And like, I'm in the middle of Manhattan. <laughs> these were like one watt light bulbs. 
but just as an example of the sort of the 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 enthusiasm with which the the, the aggression with which they want to fight any light that's going the wrong direction. So uh, so tell me just a little more about yourself and what um, uh, what you see your role is in this panel. Well, um, until a few years ago, you're absolutely correct. My attention was facing downwards, light pollution that originated from, from the ground. And I was very pretty active on that. And so I'm, I'm right now in my second round of being on the IDA board. But with the launch of SpaceX's uh, 60 Starlink satellites, I actually uh, took an active role with uh, five of the other, four of the other people on this uh, on this um, panel, to do about four different workshops. Most of them uh, focusing on satellite constellations, and as a result, we now have an IAU center that I'm part of the management team uh, for the protection of the dark and quiet skies from satellite uh, constellation interference. If you could say that ten times so fast, IAU, you win a prize. It's part of IAU. The IAU the Right. The International Astronomical Union. It's not a union like a labor union. It's the it's the union <laughs> of the international astronomers. And right. so, if anyone were to take this on, it would be them because it's an international based organization. So um, may, we'll come back to you one, many times one, in this. May I make one correction, if it's all right. We're, we're no longer oh, oh, NOAO. Please, please. We're no longer the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. We are now Noir Lab. Even better, right? Noir so wanted, lab. Yeah, NS, NSF's Noir, noir lab. Noir, that's to, French for dark or black. Or is that right? Noir. Yeah, it's like it's like Cafe Noir, right? <laughs> or, <laughs> okay. film, film Noir, right? No, no, it's a. It's okay, a, oh, that happened without me looking. So thanks for correcting me yeah. on, on that. I, I get dinged so later. We'll get back if I didn't to you. Say to, that. <laughs> we'll get back to you to try to distinguish what we really mean by light pollution surface emanating and satellite sure. pollution that might also contribute light pollution to our problems. Um, let's go on to Meredith Rawls. Meredith, we got hey you here? Yeah. Yeah, hey, uh, you're a staff scientist with um, the Verrett Rubin Observatory uh, and Indeed. its Legacy Survey for Space and Time, LSST, which is how it was known until, only how it was known until Vera Rubin, who had passed away, one mm -hmm. of the more distinguished among us in our field. Uh, and it's a brilliant naming opportunity mm -hmm. and that we all were totally behind that. Um, that observatory, I didn't bring anyone in. For, we, I, we, I could have gotten people from a hundred of different observatories. I got you for this panel because that telescope is not your ordinary telescope. Please describe what it does and how it may be uniquely susceptible to this problem. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington, but I work for Vera Rubin Observatory, which is being built in Chile right now. It's and well, one thing that's special about it is it's actually still under construction, so we don't have like pictures from it yet. Um, but in in less than two years, ah, um, we're going to turn this thing on and start taking a high resolution movie of the entire southern sky for a decade. So it's not the kind of normal telescope where astronomers can write a proposal and say, hey, I'd love to look at my favorite galaxy or favorite stars. Um, please do it for an hour next week, please. Um, it, none of that. Instead, we have a scheduler algorithm that will try to optimize, which is an impossible problem, but will do its best to optimize scanning the entire southern sky so that we can kind of revisit every area, find things that have changed and move, um, and really image some faint structures that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. It's really exciting. Yeah. So, so so the fact that you're getting a movie, that means you'd be able to find asteroids that are moving, correct? Indeed. It's not just a single snapshot of, of whatever someone was looking up and finding that night. You can yeah. track things. So if I'm trying to find an asteroid that could put Earth in harm's way, and all you're detecting are satellite trails, this could be a data, a, a data sifting problem that's not Indeed. yet solved. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yes, that's one of my, my deepest concerns. Uh, I don't do solar system science. It's not my background so much, but I have tons of colleagues who are so excited to use Rubin Observatory for finding asteroids, not just potential killer asteroids, but all kinds of cool rocks in the solar system and characterizing them, but also ones that might intersect our orbit. Um, and if instead we're just seeing a whole bunch of satellite streaks, we won't be able to, to find them or figure out their orbits and, and know in advance what's going on. So it's a form of pollution in a sense. Yeah. yeah. It's fair to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's keep going here. Getting again, anybody on online here. Uh, we have Dr. Aparna Venkatesan. I think I said that right. Uh, Aparna, come on on. Where are you? 
There she goes. Yeah. Hello. Welcome to the Asimov panel. Uh, and I have on your, by your cosmologist, we got you here, and professor in the Department of Physics, Astronomy, University of San Francisco. And that's not why we have you here, not because you're a professor and you're a cosmologist, but you, you have taken a special professional interest in what voice indigenous peoples have or should have in discussions that relate to the night sky and decisions the world makes about what we're putting in the night sky. So could you tell us a little bit more about that and, and what you plan, how you plan to plug in to this moving frontier, this, this wild west of space, space debris? Thank you very much, Neil. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be here today. Um, and I also am grateful for this group of people, many of whom I'm already working with. It has really been a career privilege, so thank you. Um, I just want to briefly acknowledge those whose ancestral homelands I live and work on, the Coast Miwok and Ohlone of Northern California, and the traditional custodians of the land, water, and skies where each of you are. So. I'm sure we'll get to expand on some of these ideas over the course of this event. And speaking for myself, uh, I am not indigenous to this part of the world. Uh, I just share my own perspective and experience from years of working with global indigenous communities. I think so much is done with common shared resources in the name of the common good but in a way that doesn't invite all stakeholders to the table. And I think that's particularly important right now because we're really at an existential crossroads, not just for the planet, but also for space. There are so many competing interests and so many competing concerns. And I'm sure we'll get to amplify many of the points, but I want to start out with something that we all know which is we are ancient, either through the exciting journey our atoms have had for 14 billion years and through our millennia old relationship with the sky. So I view the spectrum of human knowledge to contain modern astronomy as well as indigenous knowledge. It's not an either or, but a yes and. Uh, it's part of the integrative spectrum of being human, and how all of us really have related to the sky over the millennia. So with satellites, wouldn't that just give me more stuff to relate to in the sky? We have satellites in the sky. I mean, I'm being a little bit of a devil's advocate there, but if it's more stuff in the sky, it, the sky is busy now, the way the ocean was busy, the way the land is busy. So why should the sky be held any different in that well, respect, indigenously? Yeah. Um, well, I'll mention a few key aspects that are cornerstones of indigenous knowledge, again, from what I've listened to and learned from my indigenous colleagues and collaborators, one of which is sustainability. Is the way we are approaching space sustainable? Can we get beyond the next few years, no matter how orthogonal the concerns, whether we related to it personally or culturally or scientifically or through military commercial ventures, we all wanna have access and operate for decades and centuries, not mere years. So I'll mention the sustainability as well as interdisciplinary collaboration um, and scientific innovation rooted in cultural identity. That's something academia is not so good at. And that's something that what's, what's, we can learn from indigenous communities. What's interesting to me is this word, this notion of sustainability, which is sort of the buzzword of recent years, is actually a quite old concept for, with in indigenous uh, ways. So we're just sort of rediscovering the value of that. Exactly. Uh, so let me go on. Yeah, let me go on right up to Therese Jones. Therese, uh, where are you? Therese Jones. There you go. Thank you. Hey. Uh, so I've got your, 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 your resume here, Senior Director of Policy, the Satellite Industry Association. Ooh. <laughs> are you ready for us? Are you, are you ready? 
Uh, so, so, and you, where you do the, all the things you would expect a representative organization to do for the industry, you work on regulatory, legislative, um, uh, space sustainability, of course, cybersecurity, the list goes on and on and on. So but as I looked on your resume, your background is in astrophysics. Am I, is that correct? It is indeed. Okay. So what happened when you crossed over? <laughs> 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 well, I, I was looking for uh, viable jobs, and the space industry is rapidly growing, um, and a lot of the skills that are utilized in astrophysics are also great for the space industry as well. Okay, and so do you, so do you have a soft spot for all of the crying astronomers that are out there, knowing that the, spa the Satellite Industry Association has you know, quarterly reports, annually, annual reports as their bottom line relative to just what anyone feels like they want the sky to be, either scientifically or indigenously. I certainly do have a soft spot for astronomy and think we need to work together to minimize the impact of satellites on astronomy. I mean, we're in a really exciting time in the space industry, rapid growth. Uh, since I started this job a little over four years ago, the number of satellites on orbit has almost tripled to about 5,000. Um, and there are proposals for tens of thousands of satellites to be launched over the next decade. So, massive growth. Yeah, I, I, I want to get back to you on that very point, because I was just wondering how many satellites is enough. <laughs> but I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, last and certainly not least among us on this panel of six is uh, Colonel Scott Brodeur. Uh, uh, Colonel, welcome to... to uh, to the Asimov panel, and you. you are with the U.S. Space Force, uh, formerly with the U.S. Air Force. You're a colonel, uh, actually scheduled to retire in October, so you become a regular civilian uh, <laughs> at that point. But uh, I'm looking at your resume. It's got all the key words in it. It's like if there was like security space bingo, you get it like, okay, Joint Space Operations Center, Combined Space Operations, National Space Defense, Mission Partner, Intelligence, uh, all it's all there, and so uh, please tell us what what is the environment of space today that it wasn't back when back in the old days two years ago before we had a space force. Yeah, sure. the uh, The most interesting part that uh, we I've seen at least throughout my career is the transition from a peaceful, benign environment to a contested environment from our adversaries. So looking at it through a military lens, we've seen um, an increased amount of counter space capabilities that ultimately are debris causing and kinetic. And so from uh, as, a, as everyone's aware of uh, the vice president's uh, commitment to not doing debris causing uh, anti satellite tests, that's a step in the right direction because we've seen as you mentioned in the opening charts, um, the kinetic test from China back in 2007, you know, they weren't, they weren't quite a, a counter space power at that point. You could almost forgive them uh, as, as hard as that is to say for doing that. But what happened in November with the Russian test was pretty inexcusable. It's clearly a message, an irresponsible message, but those type of events have to stop. And we just can't, we can't have that type of debris on orbit because as you know, believe it or not, the space debris and space sustainability are just as important to our everyday way of life as it is to our national security. So we keep uh, we keep an eye on those objects, and as as you know, many of those things are not trackable. And so we talk a lot about what we think is in space. That's just what we can track. And so there's a lot of exponentially uh, more things that uh, we aren't tracking as easily uh, or as frequently uh, or at all. And so those things are affecting all of those orbital regimes that Dr. Jaw talked about. Uh, what are, can you distinguish for us the difference between you protecting, you know, uh, military uh, conceived satellites, either the military version of the GPS plus spy satellites, that sort of thing. But we have satellites that represent a huge, a huge fraction of our business sector that enables them, empowers them to do their work. So do you see the Space Force as also protecting assets 
as a, as a separate thing from just um, checking to see if adversaries are, are, are poking us? I mean, how do yeah. you view the entire space environment? Because it's all completely intermingled up there. Dr. Tyson, that's pretty much my current role at the National Space Defense Center now is identifying what capabilities that we would consider high value. Those are commercial capabilities. Those are allied space capabilities. Those are Department of Defense, Intelligence Community, National Reconnaissance. Those are all, all of our capabilities that we would look to to protect and defend. And, and most, you know, our protection and defense capability is underpinned by understanding what's going on in the domain. And so having space domain awareness and, and seeing and tracking and understanding what's up there and what its intent is, is of the utmost importance. When we talk through the problem set of debris and just more things on orbit, it complicates those solutions. It complicates our ability to maintain awareness of what's going on. And that's not just for military purposes. That's also for safety of flight. And, and there's humans in space. And we want to make sure that um, we're not doing things and not losing awareness of the most critical conjunctions um, that are exacerbated by debris. And if, uh, if this whole tourist thing kicks off, then there'll be many more humans in space than even are, that make the news right now. It would just be a natural thing people do for their vacation. And so that's a whole other frontier, of course. Um, normally when people think of an explosion, they think of a very um, a carefully conceived explosive device, some kind of a bomb, nuclear, chemical, whatever. When you describe a kinetic uh, uh, attack on a satellite, could you, just, could you say exactly what that is relative to how we might be thinking of a detonation? Yeah, sure. So when we had uh, the recent uh, direct descent anti-satellite launch between, uh, it was the Russian launch versus one of their own satellites, Cosmos 1408. That's, that is just a, a that is a two uh, objects just colliding with one another. So there doesn't have to be uh, an explosion is in your words to, to actually create the effect. It's just, it's kinetically bringing two objects together. That's, that creates a massive debris in the trajectory of that um, kinetic weapon and the trajectory of the object as it was in its orbital path. And so for years, there will be debris along that, that path of travel. And so depending on where these collisions happen, like the Iridium uh, Cosmos uh, event that you mentioned that was in 2009, or even the Feng Yang and the Chinese ASAT, those two events created huge uh, debris patterns within their uh, orbital paths that will affect the other ca satellites and capabilities in the vicinity for years and years to come. The lower, the lower you are in altitude, the more uh, apt the debris will be to burn into the atmosphere. But those events that happen at higher altitudes tend to remain on orbit for, for decades. Decades. More about... Uh... In the, in the image we saw at the beginning in, in one of the slides I had, we saw all of this debris like, like buzzing right close to the Earth. Why doesn't all that, if that's the lowest in the orbital space, it, has, it seems that would be most susceptible to atmospheric drag. Why doesn't all that drop out more quickly than it does? Yeah, so, so look, um, this whole idea of atmospheric drag, like it's a real thing, but for objects that are, I don't know, higher than like 800 or so kilometers of altitude, just like Colonel Brodeur said, it's gonna take, you know, decades if not centuries. Uh, and, and if things are above 1200 kilometers, I mean, for all intents and purposes, that stuff is up there kind of like forever. So there's a lot of stuff that just never comes back. And then things in Leo do come back, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's very altitude dependent. The higher it is, the longer it's going to take for it to come down. Um, but at the same time, you can't just put a bunch of stuff at like 300 kilometers altitude because you're going to be fighting atmospheric drag the whole time. And that becomes a very expensive thing to do. F fighting, fighting Mother Nature to stay in orbit uh, is a bad proposition. So. so to stay in orbit, you need extra fuel to keep boosting. The Hubble telescope has had, had to be boosted uh, and well, it put at a very high orbit. But um, of course, the space station gets boosted. So 
So that when you say it, it's expensive, you mean you have to design the thing to always yeah. stay where you need it to be. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, right? I mean, uh, I, I love uh, our, our dear friend, Albert uh, Einstein, who talked about curvature of space time, right? It's like, um, you know, things closer to very massive objects, space time is, is, is more curved than that sort of thing. And so gravity, I say, is an equal opportunity accelerator. It doesn't matter what the mass is. Tell me where you are and I'll tell you how fast you're going to be going. But the thing is, atmospheric drag uh, beyond gravity slows stuff down, kind of like riding in your car, you're going at speed, put the window down, put your hand out, your hand kind of get pushed back. That's the sort of thing that satellites are kind of feeling depending on the altitude. So you got to actually use thrusters to stay in orbit the lower that you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Connie, tell me what, uh, why do you care if there's satellites up there in space, if you've got the ground lights uh, problem understood, even if it's not completely solved? Well, uh, in terms of being an astronomer, it really does affect a lot of the imagery that we do in terms of um, if you uh, if I have wide field of view on a telescope and you're looking at a great portion of the sky and you have this this satellite come along and it's going you know across your image, it's going to actually if you keep your uh, if you're integrating for a great length of time, it's going to uh, form a streak, and and uh, a lot of these satellites, especially in low Earth orbit, can be pretty bright, and so uh, you're going to have a good fraction of at least a, a good uh, segment of the telescopes that are in existence at this point and soon to be in existence, like the Rubin Observatory, um, that are going to be affected uh, a great deal by this uh, the streaks across their imagery. So um, we're doing our best to work actually with industry at this point, a uh, number of the big, uh, big, uh, big guys that are out there, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, see if we can come up with mutual mitigation solutions. So a mitigation solution, what does that look like other than don't launch? <laughs> I mean, so Therese, are you in conversation with people that, that is there actual dialogue there? Yeah, there's certainly dialogue. Um, I've been working with Connie, Meredith, Aparna, and others uh, to try and work to try and work on mitigating the brightness of these satellites. I mean, I don't think anyone expected uh, the Starlink satellites that SpaceX launched to be as bright as they were, and so that was um, a learning moment for all of us. And uh, we've been working with well, one SpaceX has put a lot of resources both in engineering and just materials and experimenting how to make their satellites fainter. They tried initially painting them darker, and then they put these sunshades on them. Um, that you know, sort of um, directed the reflectivity in a different direction. Um, and I've launched them at a knife edge so they're less reflective um, directly back down to Earth. But they've been experimenting and working with astronomers to get better data on what makes these satellites fainter um, and try to decrease them so that they're not a problem for these wide field observatories, or at least less of a problem. And now we're working with other companies across industry to try and implement some of the same lessons learned from SpaceX and hoping that everyone can sort of take these lessons learned and implement them as they're designing satellites. Neil, you know what that reminds me of? Um, we, uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, one of the, cl the closest town to Kitt Peak National Observatory. Uh, uh, Connie, tell us about what the, the agreement that occurred between the astronomers and the municipal leaders of Tucson, Arizona. Oh my goodness. Well, they have had, um, uh, in recent years, they have had uh, um, replacement of the lights. Is that what you're talking about, Neil? So that they have- Yeah, yeah, just the total, yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they, they have they have ordinances that other cities emulate. That's right. To oh, okay. accomplish so that's... what- no, go ahead. In 2012, I think uh, initially and even earlier, they had uh, extreme uh, wonderful uh, ordinances put in place because they're only about 65 miles from the National Observatory uh, on Kitt Peak. And, uh, and so uh, by putting these into, into fruition, uh, they actually set an example for the world uh, to be able to do things like that as well. And another dark sky city also in Arizona is Flagstaff, and they've done something similar as well. And they're very... Um, aware, people in Tucson are, are very aware, and they have, for the most part, uh, downward facing lights, lights that are fully shielded, so that the, the light basically goes where it's needed, not where it's is not needed. And, uh, you know, if you combine that with other factors, like only keeping them on when you need them, and placing them only where you need them, then you're looking at a fairly dark sky city, and Tucson tries to do that. So, Arpana, so that's evidence that people can cooperate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
that's very hopeful, I would think, that people with what, what might have been conflicting um, goals. But however, uh, Connie, if I remember correctly, if I tell you to put a, a lid on your light, so you're not illuminating the sky, you're just illuminating down, you can use half the wattage of that light and you end up saving money. So mm -hmm. part of, I think, why that worked was there was a benefit to the people who, who embraced the dark sky concept. All right. And it seems to me, in at least in America, you're not going to get people to do things unless they benefit. All right. And so I, I don't know, maybe I'm just a little more cynical about that. Um, no, then. yeah. No, you're, you're perfectly correct, Neil, um, because you, you cannot sell it to people saying, oh, do this for the sake of astronomy, for the astronomers that are trying to get right. data. They will not relate to that whatsoever. But you're absolutely right. And I think the number one uh, point that I think does um, st tug at the strings of people's hearts is that uh, it is part of our cultural heritage. And it is, you know, to have a beautiful dark starry night sky is a right of every human being on Earth. And so, um, and not just for astronomers to, to understand the mysteries of the universe, but for people to really become inspired through discovering uh, its wonders. And, and that's why I think to a lot of people, it is inspirational. I mean, just, just think about it. If, if um, 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 well, uh, Pulse was not inspired by, by the sky to do uh, the planets, to his compositions, musical composition, or Van Gogh to actually uh, paint Starry Night. I mean, those are people that were inspired by the night sky. And if we lose this, uh, we're losing a, a great deal, especially for our younger generation who needs that night sky to be inspired. And as we, as we sit here today, I'd say four out of every five people have never ever seen the Milky Way arching overhead. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a sin, basically not to be able to yeah, have so, that. Uh, uh, Parna, tell me what, um, how, 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 how potent is that argument that it is, a, it is a heritage of what it is to be human, let alone just one culture here or there. And so um, does that work in your experience? Uh, thank you, yeah. Neil and everyone. I, yes, I think it's potent because it hits at the fundamental harmonic of what it means to be human, that we connect to science, um, connect to the skies, not just through science, but through art, culture, and storytelling. And I want to amplify the storytelling aspect for just a moment. Um, I think one of the reasons we're called to you know, the Big Bang origin and modern cosmology or call to a lot of origin stories is because we see ourselves as part of the story that is still unfolding and that we are invited to. So as we occupy space in the way that's currently unfolding, is this a story that we are all invited to or does it just have a few leading characters and the rest of us just get to watch? That's one thing. And I absolutely agree that cooperation is very much possible when we have this integrative approach. And one way is to invest back in the community. Um, I wanna point to a few initiatives on Mauna Kea as well as other telescopes on tribal lands that the partnerships have worked out wonderfully because they invest back in the community. And in a way it's, multiple knowledge traditions revitalizing each other. When we name discoveries on the modern telescopes on Mauna Kea in the Hawaiian language, we revitalize each other's traditions. But of course, the future of telescopes on Mauna Kea is a question for the Hawaiian people. Uh, but I just wanna to point to, there are initiatives that have had wonderful cross-pollination. But surely there are people in the world, uh, Therese, where uh, someone launches a bunch of satellites because they're going to bring internet to some corner of the world. So I'm sitting there, I want the internet, and I'm going to choose, do I want the night sky or do I want the internet? Okay, I can dig up Hubble photos, all right? We have a much better image of the night sky than I'll ever have, but at least I, that's, I do that with the internet that the satellites are providing me. So, so we, how, do you, how do you balance, if it's balanceable at all, the actual needs of developing areas of the world to be served by these satellites, because we're not laying cable, right? We're not laying copper, okay? Um, with 
yes, this, this primal urge to see the universe as it is and not as we, as we put graffiti upon it. I, I think that's a great question that we're still trying to figure out the answer to. Um, you know, in talking to indigenous people across the world, I don't think there's been, you know, a monolithic response to that. Um, we've had some tribal nations in both the US and Canada approach um, satellite operators directly and say, you know, well, especially with the last two years of COVID, we absolutely need internet connectivity for education, for business, um, for telehealth purposes, because our countries are not investing in the infrastructure that it would take, which is very expensive in rural areas, um, to get internet connectivity to us. And we want to be part of the 21st century. But at the same time, you definitely do need feedback um, from them also about the heritage of the night sky. So we're really trying to, you know, drive down the brightness of these satellites so that they're invisible to the naked eye. And SpaceX, for the most part, has gotten to that limit, though not quite the limit astronomers want. Um, but I think getting the perspectives of these people, you know, how do you want to, do you want to be connected to the internet? What does that look like for you? Um, is there, you know, a communal mechanism where we can uh, provide connectivity to the greatest number of people? Or, you know, what are your opinions on the overall number of satellites and what does that mean for you? I think those are all valid questions to be asking. Yeah, Meredith, I, if satellites, my understanding of satellites is when you see them, by the way, I kind of enjoy spotting satellites, you know, after sunset, it's kind of fun. Uh, in a star party, I point them out. It's, it's always a crowd pleaser, right? Oh, yeah, this is something we launched or humans launched, and there it is moving among the stars, or at least your sight line to the stars. But in every case, those satellites come into view only during twilight. Uh, at their altitude, they, they, during twilight, we're in darkness, but they're high enough to see sunlight. So if it's only during twilight that they're visible, then what do you care? You're getting data after twilight. Don't they all sort of disappear anyway? That would be nice, wouldn't it? That would solve some of our problems. Not all of them, but some of them. Unfortunately, uh, many of the satellites are visible all night long. You're correct that the majority, um, they're usually the most closest to twilight because they're not yet um, in Earth's shadow. But there are some, especially depending on their altitude. If they're a little bit higher up, they're visible for a longer period of the night. If they're a little bit lower down, they're visible for a shorter period of the night. So, but it's also a function of latitude. If you're at a high, if your observatory or you are at a higher latitude, um, then that effect, the difference is less pronounced. And so it, 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 there's a lot of different factors going on here that, that affect exactly what the visibility will be. But I, I wanted to briefly t touch back on this, on this idea of, you know, internet versus astronomy, I, I don't think that we should frame it as, as a binary question. You know, I'm an astronomer, I care about the night sky a lot, but without the internet, I, I wouldn't be able to do my job or do any astronomy at all. Um, and I feel like when we, when we say it needs to be one or the other, uh, we're not allowing ourselves to be really creative enough or frame the problem in a, in a bigger, in a big enough sense. Yeah, and that's true for so many points of conflict in today's society as well. Uh, so that's a little, it's a little scary when people do choose sides and then no one is in the middle talking about how to resolve both, right? They just want to win the argument. And then, and, and at that point, really at the end of the day, nobody wins. Uh, let me get uh, more about, let me ask you what I've read about the Kessler syndrome. Could you describe what that is? And then I want to take it straight to the Colonel to see what kind of thinking they've done about this as well. And am I correct to read, because they didn't use the term, in the movie Gravity, they basically portrayed the Kessler syndrome with the total destruction, 100% destruction of all satellites in orbit. Yeah. So look, man, um, I think Don Kessler was uh, a tremendous asset uh, to the world, to, to, to the US government and NASA and that sort of thing. I read his paper. Um, I'm not a fan of Kessler syndrome, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, th this, this idea that, you know, if, if humans don't launch anything else, um, there's, go there's gonna be this tipping point at which uh, space becomes unusable because things collide with each other, you know, ad infinitum, you know, forever, you know, per secula seculorum, as they would say in Latin. Um, I have been an observer of mother nature and anytime that uh, humans stop uh, 
inputting stuff into a system. Mother Nature seeks equilibrium. Um, so I, I'm a fan of seeing how Mother Nature tends to seek equilibrium. And if humans stopped launching satellites, uh, things will collide with each other for sure uh, on their own. But at some, uh, at some point, the collisions become less frequent uh, over long time scales. My guess is that Mother Nature will start cleansing some stuff. When I say long time scales, I mean, you know, centuries, millennia, that sort of thing. So I just think that our measuring sticks tend to be very short in terms of like human lifetimes and that sort of stuff. And we like to we, we like to kind of go, uh, you know, a bit of the hyperbole with this sort of thing. So I think that Kessler syndrome is not well, a hyperbole real thing. makes a movie. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. hyperbole makes a movie. But, but I'm, I'm asking not the current satellites colliding, but we're launching thousands of satellites at a, at a clip. So yeah. the space is becoming ever more crowded. Yes. And so, yeah, yeah, we yeah. still have people chop, um, kinetic killing satellites. Yeah. Because I, let's, I'll, I will presume we'll get uh, Scott to uh, confirm this, but there's no reason to think that's going to stop. There are yeah. other spacefaring nations who will probably want to demonstrate that as well. Sure. And so here we, here, it's, uh, forgive the reference, but it's like, peeing in the bathtub, right? Of Everyone course. is there in the same bathtub. Yeah. So, so let me tell you what the problem is. I like thinking of things in terms of orbital carrying capacity. That's like a real thing. Just like there's a carrying capacity to highways and ecosystems, any given orbital highway, sun synchronous, you know, Leo, Geo, whatever, has a finite capacity of how many things it can carry without things bumping into each other and things that we don't want to see happen happening, right? So does Therese I, think this way as well? Okay. You know, is she saying, yes, we have a maximum that we won't launch beyond? It doesn't sound like she's talking that way. I don't think Teresa's yet ready to talk that way because there's some science that needs to be had. And for sure, Therese is a formidable scientist. So, of course, she would not be speaking beyond the headlights of science. <laughs> yeah, so I appreciate that question. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done in examining the concept of an oral carrying capacity, but it also, the, carry, the, the concept of a carrying capacity also changes with new technology. Like until recently, we didn't have automated collision avoidance. Um, and so that makes a big difference in how many satellites you can have up there. Um, Mariba's doing a great job getting better data at tracking all of this. If we have better data, we can have more stuff up there. Um, so it's sort of like, if you think about it as an evolution of, you know, when there weren't many cars on the road, we didn't need traffic lights. Um, but as we got more and more cars, we needed traffic lights and other, you know, road signs to help mitigate the congestion. Um, so what those next steps are, you know, depends on the new technologies that are evolving. And we have active debris removal coming online too. So if, we de if we're deorbiting things, maybe this capacity looks different. Booyah. Well, that's a damn good answer right there. You got me... <laughs> got me almost in your camp therese um uh, colonel do, do you guys think about what is is there some maximum carrying capacity that let, let me let me sharpen that question is there a crowdedness of space where you can't guarantee security i don't think oh, well, space is big i'm somewhere in between uh you know Kessler, doom and gloom, and space is really, really, really big. Um, but here's, here's how I think about it. Uh, just during the Cosmos 1408 uh, destructive test, we sheltered uh, the astronauts in the ISS 350 times. And that meant there was a piece of 1408 debris that met the criteria that uh, the probability of intercept with the ISS was plausible enough that they would shelter them for their safety. That's a lot. I'm concerned that there are more things in space that we're just not tracking. And so when you have a breakup event uh, in geosynchronous orbit, those small objects are extraordinarily hard to track. And so wh where are they? And what's gonna happen? It doesn't take, you know, we talk about things in terms of the size of a cell phone, but what about the smaller things that it's only gonna take one small piece to have that catastrophic effect on a spacecraft, which are very fragile. And so I'm a little concerned that uh, our technology is still something that needs to catch up so that we can see dim, small objects uh, and be able to catalog them correctly to have the awareness. I don't think uh, right now that with the mega constellations going up, it'll be a different story. I, I have less concern, for example, of 
Starlink right now providing uh, satellite internet services, then uh, what will happen when China puts up their mega constellations and in Leo, that's gonna be a national security issue that we'll have to deal with. And, and we practice with Starlink. And so we're able to- I'd like the idea of, of collision avoiding avoidance sensors on satellites. That just sound, that sounds great. And the analogy to cars were really dangerous until they said, maybe we need a stoplight. You know, <laughs> maybe we need lanes. Maybe we need a crosswalk. You know, um, I, this is, and, we know there's value to the technology. So we, no one's, and no one's thought about it yet to, uh, I, I think it was Meredith who was saying, we haven't thought about how to make it work for everyone. If we haven't thought about that yet, uh, it does, there's not a reason to be arguing with each other before we've actually given the rest of that uh, sensible thought. So, and that, to Connie's really point, to Connie's point with uh, with this, the number of satellites, I think, I mean, there's room out there to start putting a sustainability rating on everything we put in space. You know, maybe we maybe you have a requirement to have less of a visual magnitude or whatever. You put some type of rating that uh, suggests here's how I'm gonna pollute from a light perspective, or here's how I'm gonna pollute, or, or here, you know, there's no, numerous ways which we could at least know going into uh, a satellite launch, uh, what the sustainability aspects are of each, of each uh, piece of uh, man-made object we put in space. Connie, you had something to put in there? Yeah, we, we are doing our, uh, we are starting to work with industry to do our best to come up with best practices and guidelines for um, mitigations and stuff like that, that they need to hear in order for them to design their satellites, the next generation satellites with, with those things in mind. But my, my worry is, is you know, we, we can put these, we can pre-design them, we can put these band-aids uh, that astronomers are trying to do avoidance kind of software for, you know, not avoiding the satellites when they go overhead, but I don't know. I, I, um, I, I'm just, how can I say this? I had this really good question and now it's not coming to me, but um, it's like plastics. Okay. It's like, you know, you, you have this newfangled. I didn't invention. see that one coming. Plastic. Yeah, no, yeah I know. It, it, I'm trying, trying Plastic to satellites, there. man. Come on. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 no, no, plastics where, you know, this is this greatest invention since sliced bread, basically, and, and everybody loved it and wanted to put it to use right away. Nobody thought about the environmental impact, right, that, that plastics would have. And now we're, we're trying to do this remedial stuff afterwards in, in order to fix mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm mm -hmm. saying is, is there some way that we could slow down just a little and let scientists do their thing with with the uh, you know with the engineers at the various um, big uh, you know space industry uh, companies and 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 try to um, fix this a little bit better than you know continuing what we're doing now. So that's my Meredith, question. Meredith, what were you saying? Yeah, I was going to make a very similar point to Connie, and and that that really we need to think of orbital space as a human environment. And this is a large piece of what we argue in, in the paper that you so kindly advertised at the start of this whole thing. Um, and, and, and that is, is exact, the plastics in the ocean or plastics in general is a, is a wonderful analogy for this. I feel like the carrying capacity argument is kind of like saying, okay, but like how many plastic cups can we put in the ocean like before the fish die, right? And like, that's not the right question here. Like, you know, we all want to be able to use space for so many different amazing purposes for decades, for generations. And that's really not how we're framing the problem in most of these discussions. And that really concerns me. I think we need to consider the, the uh, cumulative effects when like, you know, a few satellites are launched, that's fine. A few more, yeah, no problem. But then suddenly it's like hundreds of thousands and we're in a totally different regime. That, that's what concerns me. Uh, forgive me how my brain is wired because I spent so much time sitting next to a professional comedian, but you were talking about cups in the ocean. And all I can think of is the fish adapt to use those red cups that you use at parties, and <laughs> they're all at the bar drinking. Come on, <laughs> man! Come on, Neil. <laughs> yeah, we got to build a party boat for space. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, or pardon that. What, 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 what did you have to contribute here? Just wanted to amplify the environmental uh, aspects of this issue, as many people have brought up, uh, but it's even broken down into several sub-issues. 
And this is where I think global coordination, global regulation and oversight, learning from the history of other industries, like many people here have brought up, is important transportation or other things. And, you know, moving away from the binary thinking of earth environment versus space environment, it's a continuum. And the environmental aspect has at least three parts to it, environmental aspects that launch sites, and then environmental aspects in orbit, which include the debris issues and keeping track of some of the smallest untrackable debris, which is not as easily removed, right? It could lead potentially to a rise in global sky brightness that is nonlinear and we don't know quite which way it'll go. Uh, removing streaks is one thing. We don't know what we can do about a rise in global sky brightness. But the third aspect is that of re-entry, right? We have yet to have a, you know, effective debris, you know, we don't know how well debris removal will work. Our only approach right now is kind of to decommission them. And I think the time scale is, they have up to 25 years, although most companies aim for much less. But the decommissioning then puts it back into our atmosphere, into our oceans. So how do we balance the health of the oceans to the plastics analogy, to the health of the oceans? Yeah, that's something I, people us. haven't talked about, Arpana, that people haven't really gone there. The fact that the Pacific Ocean is one third of all longitude on Earth, which makes it an ideal toilet bowl to drop dead satellites that you deorbit. Um, if we drain the, the Pacific Ocean, the whole history of the space program <laughs> would be there at the bottom of the ocean. And I don't hear people talking about keeping the ocean clean. I think uh, otherwise you have to design satellites that completely burn up in the atmosphere with no pieces left. So Moriba, is that something that's real? Yeah, look, I mean, this is the thing that really gets my blood boiling, man, because I think you, you hit on it, is that people just don't understand the interconnectedness of all these types of ecosystems, right? They think, oh, ocean is separate from land, land separate from air, air separate from space. All this stuff is really interconnected. And I think um, the thing that, I think the challenge that we have is to show the rest of humanity evidence of this interconnectedness so that people will be you know, more reluctant to say, you know what, that's not my problem. Uh, outer space, who cares about that sort of stuff? Oh, we got all this junk in space. You know, what? how is that affecting me like right here in Los Angeles kind of stuff? Like, I think that we can do a better job showing this interconnectedness so that people can actually, I don't know, feel some empathy and compassion and wanna solve these sorts of things. So yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, I bet Scott could, uh, could comment on this that there is no coordinated security without all the branches of the armed forces that specialize in their realm, there's always gotta be somebody above that coordinating it. Otherwise, what are you doing? It's, it's a, it becomes a free for all at that point, right? So we have close, it's, close- it's just as much of a, between. Yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, it's just a, as much of a problem coordinating it in military operations as it is in environmental realms. So trying to, uh, to, to, to understand the interconnectedness of all the domains of warfare, it has the same effect that it does understanding the connectedness in an environmental perspective. Because I remember, I'm old enough to remember that no one really thought about the atmosphere as a, a, as a connective element of the Earth's ecosystem, right? So you'd see drawings of, if we say draw Earth, no one would draw Earth with clouds. They would just draw continents and oceans, and that's it. And then when NOAA was founded in 1970, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, it was like, oh my gosh, ocean and atmosphere in the same phrase. Uh, maybe we should pay closer attention to that. So, uh, so it looks like we are at the cusp, uh, the cusp that's very, very positive. Maybe it's not that positive. We're at the front door of having to think that way about this problem. That we all agree on that. Now, Ooh, yeah. now, now let me ask you, uh, Colonel, you're, you're military and you wanna make things safe for everybody. Why don't you all figure out a way to, to scoop up all the debris? Why not, <laughs> can, can we make that an, an objective of the Space Force going forward? Now that yeah. that's your domain? I'm all about cleaning up uh, the space debris, but what, and, and I think from a, Space Force and Space Command perspective, 
what we're working through is how to incentivize industry to do that. And so how do we get uh, enough profit out there so that a company would be incentivized to go out and try to clean this up? Or how do we regulate such that there would be an incentive to, to build a capability? What we run into uh, problematic- That's especially true. That, that's, they'll totally buy into that if it also means they can conduct safer business in space. Right. That's that uh, um, uh, self benefit from thinking altruistically. Yeah. But from a military perspective, anything that we could build that would be beneficial to cleaning something up would automatically have a dual use connotation. And we do it with Chinese capability as well that has a grappling arm technology. So if you built something that could reach out and grab something, it would immediately be perceived as a counter space threat. And so coming from um, industry, seeing things like a mission extension vehicle from Northrop and others that are able to uh, extend the life of satellites, those, those things need to be incentivized. And you know, having something that can go out and clean up debris in low Earth orbit, um, I, I would support wholeheartedly uh, industry taking on those. And I would, I would be very supportive of us as a nation incentivizing and as with allies and partners as well to get more people on board with doing that. Just to be clear, when you say um, dual use, you mean whatever was the intended use to fix up, mend, remove. Dual use would mean it could be used for uh, uh, aggress aggressive uh, uh, intent, with aggressive intent. Is that yeah, what, you, we that's saw, what you mean by dual use? We saw two capabilities out of China, the SJ-17 and SJ-21. Those both had robotic arm uh, or both have robotic arm technology on them. Uh, they could just as easily make a repair on a satellite or um, do some on-orbit maintenance as they could remove a solar panel off of an adversary's satellite or grapple them uh, and prevent them from doing their mission. And so there is a military uh, civilian dual use dichotomy that if the US government invests in such technology, it could be perceived as having a nefarious or a counter space uh, capability associated with it. And it wouldn't be just uh, labeled or characterized as something that was good for the environment or debris cleaning uh, type of uh, capability. And of course, that's what you're paid to do, to recognize how something could be used <laughs> in, in a threatening way. Uh, I'm reminded at this moment of the 1967 Space Treaty, uh, a treaty for the for the peaceful, it's, it's got some long title that I always forget, the peaceful use of outer space or something. And it was signed by spacefaring nations and aspiring spacefaring nations at the time, the United States included. Let me just ask, is that, does any of that still apply today? That was 55 years ago. Um, I remembered there was a little loophole that said you're allowed to, it said no armament in space. And if someone needs help, you go help them, even if they're your adversary. It was very kumbaya. It was very like United Nations 1960s, okay? It, it's written all over it. But there was a little loophole there that said, you can defend yourself if necessary. I don't know if those are the exact words, but that was the intent. So is, are, is modern presence in space honoring that space treaty or, we, or is it time for that to be rewritten? To, to put it into the 21st century. So I'm, I'm assuming you're asking me, Dr. Tyson. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, I, so the Outer Space Treaty has a lot of cool pieces to it. And I think the loophole that, um, I think the loophole you're referring to is uh, there, there can't be any nuclear weapons in space, which was, which was more prolific and, and concerning at the time that it was written. Um, but, but then we talk about militarization of space and weaponization of space. And there's a lot of capabilities that could be considered the militarization of space. This has happened. I mean, we've, we have communication satellites that support military operations and we have GPS satellites that support military operations and, and reconnaissance and surveillance satellites, et cetera. But what we've seen most recently um, is the weaponization of space. And you saw um, just a few years ago, uh, a Russian Cosmos launch that that followed closely to a U.S. surveillance satellite, and um, uh, we felt it was an unsafe testing of that kinetic weapon. 
um, which was a, they, uh, General Raymond refers to it as a Russian nesting doll, where it, it's a satellite that has a smaller engagement satellite that can fire an actual kinetic weapon. And so it's those types General of- General Raymond has actually been on my, on my podcast. General Raymond is the commander of the Space Force. Is that correct? Chief, how, chief how, of how Space Operations. How do you refer to him specifically? Yeah. Jay. Okay. I'm just kidding. He's the chief of space operations. <laughs> I don't call him that. Homie, homie, don't play that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, but this is this has really become what the crux of the of the issue is, is how the proliferation of these weapons. Now Vice President Harris came out and said, we're not going to bring out weapons and conduct tests that are going to be debris causing, but these the, the weaponization that's happening from China and Russia are really uh, holding at risk these, these space capabilities that we not only use in our everyday lives. I mean, you can see through the use of GPS, everyone on this, on this panel and everyone that's attending is using that uh, every day in their lives from every credit card transaction, et cetera. And so these uh, capabilities are being held at risk. And so working with allies and partners and working with uh, commercial and through hopefully a whole of government approach, we'd like to see uh, a norms of behavior discussion. And we'd like to see some uh, normalization of what uh, behaviors are acceptable and, and what aren't. And I think for the United States and our allies and, and commercial partners, um, right now, things that are debris causing just don't make any sense. I, and we're, we're creating debris just, just by putting things in orbit, but creating unnecessary debris for tests and things that just are known technologies that don't require it, just don't make any sense. And I think we would like to get behind more of those uh, responsible behaviors. And you, you, you speak of our adversaries and our, our friends. Um, I'm reminded of a quote, I think it was Abraham Lincoln, who said, do we not defeat our enemies by making them our friends? And in, in a, if the world were friends with itself, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, uh, at least not on that path. Uh, let me, we're going to wind this down a bit, but I want to get Therese to just tell us how, how many satellites will make you happy? <laughs> how many, where does, where does it end? Thousands are being launched every 18 months or whatever is the rate. And yes, space is vast. I get that. And it's a lot of empty, I get that. But does, is anyone thinking where this will land? Just as a point we made in this panel about plastic, nobody was thinking where the end game of using plastic would take us. So wh what can you tell us about, is there a committee in the, a, uh, the SIA, Satellite Industry Association, who's thinking about the long-term future so that they can come back to us and say, no, don't do that. Well, all of our companies have different business cases that depend on different numbers of satellites. So I'm not sure we're going to come up with one number um, that will satisfy everyone. But we have had a number of discussions on space sustainability. Um, we came up with a high level set of space safety principles that all of our uh, members agreed to adhere to that uh, was talking about, you know, mitigating space debris and the design of your satellites, communicating better. Um, between different operators in the event of a collision. And I think those discussions are really important to have with industry. I think also at some point we will hit a sort of carrying capacity in terms of um, numbers of subscribers on earth who think uh, you know, these satellites are useful. And there won't be a financial incentive for some of these companies to keep launching. I mean, we've seen before mergers of companies that realize that the customers that they thought they have um, maybe don't exist or they have the wrong business model. So we're, I'm not saying that, you know, it wasn't Iridium was a, Iridium was a, was a consequence of that, wasn't it? I mean, Iridium it had great ambitions and it just never panned out in, in financially. Well, and, and then they've revived, but with a new business model and after they were um, sort of bailed out. Sure. But I think there's, there are going to be a lot of changes in the space industry. We're seeing a lot of companies with innovative technologies, but there'll certainly be some mergers and maybe not all of these satellites that are being promised will all launch. Well, I'm just glad you have an astrophysics background so you know how to talk to the rest of us and you give us an ear. And uh, just one last question I meant to ask you, Meredith. Um, the, the Vera Rubin telescope is mostly automated. Isn't that correct? Um, and it's, it's looking, from what I've read, it's, it's 
getting multiple images all the time of the night sky mm -hmm. and then there's some software that's checking for something that's changed right and then it goes back in to follow up on it all by itself is that correct more or less yeah okay so if it's that much software driven can't you just get all the launch data from Therese and saying here is th this evening's satellites that's going to cross in your sky and then have the software just take it out and not then have it confused with an asteroid later on. So we're working on a small version of that ish, um, but there's two main problems. Uh, one main problem is that in, you know, in just two years, it, the satellite population is going to continue to increase drastically. And it's really hard to predict what it's going to look like. So, you know, your, your picture of, you know, the satellites tonight is basically just covered up over the entire sky. You know, there's not like a region you can go to that won't have a satellite in it because the field of view of the telescope is so big, like there's, there's, there's literally nowhere to look and still observe the sky if you want to avoid everything. Um, we are- Is that different from airplanes? I mean, airplanes fly into your view as well, right? I, mean, yeah, I don't see you trying not, to say stop air traffic. There's not nearly as many and we didn't build a telescope by an airport. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good answer. Okay. You know, and that, that's but a real bumps. problem here is, is geographic isolation doesn't fix this problem, right? That's how we get around a lot of other light pollution or airplanes or what have you, is you build it in the middle of nowhere and turns out everywhere is, you know, under where satellites go. So we, we are working I though, to answer your other question, we are working on software to identify and like not use the pixels in the streaks that we're going to in inevitably have in our data kind of to what degree is the current question. And we, you know, we're going to do our best to provide data products that are not just full of satellite trash, um, but we're going to miss some things. You know, we're not perfect. Algorithms aren't perfect. And it's really just a, a matter of, you know, will we accidentally have some discoveries that get, you know, announced or published that are, oh, well, just kidding. That's a satellite. I'm like, sorry, everybody, retract, <laughs> retract. Um, and, you know, we don't want to spend our time and energy doing that. We, we want to do cool science. And, and so, uh, Connie, I'm just reminded by Meredith's comment that when we build observatories, we find isolated places that are away from light and away from, you know, uh, any other kind of contaminating electromagnetic energy, but you can't build it away from the sky, <laughs> no matter what, no matter okay. what. And I'll just add real quick, too, that a lot of the uh, trails, you know, at low horizon or the circumpolar sky, they can be maybe taken out for professional astronomy, but... But I think with um, real-time observations like wayfinding or other cultural practices, we don't have the back correcting software. Now they may not get as bright as for some of those horizon markers or circumpolar constellations, but, but yeah, it is a concern. They've become so numerous. It's hard to get away from them in a typical exposure, whether amateur or professional Interesting. astronomy. I use the term wayfinding, which uh, became a little more popular after the movie, uh, the Disney film. But uh, the, the wayfinders, it's basically navigation, but not in a traditional, not in the way we think of it, right? It's using nature to find your way around. Very common in the Polynesian uh, uh, folks who went thousands of miles across thousands the ocean. Thousands of miles, yeah. It's non-instrument navigation using the stars, uh, wind and ocean current patterns. So it's extraordinarily subtle and extraordinarily skilled. Um, yeah, yeah. And you start interfering with that. It's a whole cultural collapse right there of a, of a tradition. Well, uh, we, we touched everybody there more, but you got something to say. Yeah. So this whole idea of wayfinding, I think it's really good. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing, uh, with this whole privateer thing is really, in fact, we call our app wayfinder because. Well, I meant to ask you that. Wait, let me, let me actually, wait, wait, let me just, for, you are among others, uh, part of a new venture called Privateers that is all about this. Just tell, just give me a sentence or two about what Privateers are. Yeah, so so, so we, we Privateers are all about this idea that all things are interconnected and that stewardship is what we need to embrace to, uh, to thrive. And so, you know, how can we aggregate as much data and information as possible to provide humanity with insights about itself so we can stop like hurting ourselves long term, and it's focused on space at first, but it's really very holistic, connecting all these ecosystems that we spoke about. And Wayfinder is the main app, 
And the cool thing that I just want to follow up with a point about this is that, you know, it's all about having a successful conversation with the environment. That's what indigenous people do. That's what we need to do uh, for space exploration and all these things. Well, that's, that is so succinctly put. And, but I, I would say not many succinct things are profound. That was profound just to even pose it the way you did. It makes us all just pause and think and feel guilty <laughs> about the plastic cups among other things.